Okay, welcome to Psych 236, Developmental Psychology. Today we're moving on to chapter 19. We've skipped, uh, we're skipping chapter 18, so we're gonna move on to chapter 19, Emerging Adulthood uh, Psychosocial Development. And we're gonna talk, uh, well, I don't have an outline for you guys, so we're just gonna get right into it, I guess. Um, so let's talk about, uh, let's talk about first continuity and change, okay? So here's the thing. Uh, this is the period of emerging adulthood. It's more the psychological stuff. Um, so by this time, um, you should have achieved an identity. Okay. Um, but uh, the search for identity uh, actually takes a long time. Okay. The search for identity actually begins at puberty and continues much longer. Okay. Um, most adults are, you know, still seek to determine who they are. Even by this time, they may not have a... Uh, uh, completed their identity. Here's the thing, you're always growing, you're always changing. So your identity can, al can also be changing. But by this time you have, should have some idea of who you are, okay? Okay, at each stage, the outcome of the earlier crises provide the foundation of each new stage. Remember according to Erickson's theory, right? If you had issues um, earlier, issues let's say with uh, trust at the first stage of development or issues let's say with identity at adolescence, then you're more likely to have problems here, okay? But this is a time when a lot of people um, seek to uh, basically achieve their identities when this finally gets uh, developed. And it relates to several different things. So let's keep going. It relates to politics. There's gender identity, several things. Um, okay, so there's also your political identity, right? Well, you are, whether you identify as Democrat, Republican, uh, maybe somewhere in between, none, none of the above, whatever it is, most people are one or the other in this country, Republican or Democrat, and uh, they're very different as far as what they believe. What they do, on the other hand, uh, might be more similar, but as far as what we believe, there are uh, some stark differences there. <clears throat> um, just want to mention, uh, in 2008, that's the year that Obama <clears throat> ran for president and won. That was the first time in 70 years that millions of young adults, ages 18 to 25, actually voted for a candidate that was different from their grandparents than what their grandparents voted for. Most people, like I said before, when it comes to politics, when it comes to your political identity, most people uh, vote the same way their parents do, the same way their grandparents do. They're brought up in that family, raised to be to believe things that are, you know, like Democrats or Republicans, and they tend to stick to that. Um, but that was a year because we, have, we had a very different candidate that appealed to a lot of young adults, that a lot of young adults went against uh, what their parents and grandparents had taught them, okay? <clears throat> um, but yeah, your political identity is part of your identity, okay? And for the most part, you copy that from your parents, okay? We said that before. Gender identity, uh, gender identity options have broadened beyond traditional roles. <clears throat> it's now, nowadays, it's not just purely masculine and feminine, male, female. You can be somewhere in between, gender fluid, so to speak, you could be more male, less female, or, you know, there's a whole bunch of options nowadays. We've been learning more and more that uh, gender identity isn't strictly male or female. There could be a whole bunch of in-betweens, okay? <clears throat> That's part of identity as well. Let's keep going. Very important part uh, of identity during um, this period is vocational identity. Your job, your career, right? More, more like your career, right? What you want to do with yourself, right? Voc vocational identity is a part of growing up. Right? You have to figure out not just who you are, but what you're gonna do with yourself. And most Americans, most people have to work. They have to work to make a living. There's very few people that have the luxury of not working. Like people who are born rich don't have to have a job. They can just do whatever else they want, whatever fulfills them. Most of us have to have a job, right? And your vocational identity, your career is something that will be part of your identity, will define who you are. There are many who will go to college, just like you guys, right? <clears throat> and it's a kind of a moratorium to prepare for a job. Going to college is kind of like a timeout, right? A timeout to try to figure things out. I need to, uh, let me think about this. Let me try, take this kind of class, or let's try this kind of class, or this kind of thing, right? And you learn about what you like, what you do well at, what you don't do so well at, and then hopefully you make a good career choice. <clears throat> but that is part of your vocational identity, right? When you develop a career and eventually take on a job. <clears throat> Many young workers during this time, however, have temporary jobs. 
and have no loyalty to their employer. Usually ages 18 to 25, um, most who have a job during this time have jobs that are not, don't really have much to do with their identity. It could be like a temporary job or maybe they work for Costco or they work for, you know, uh, Starbucks or something like that. It may not be uh, their career. It may not be what they want to do for the rest of their lives. So you might work on McDonald's or Burger King or something like that, right? Um, that's the way it is for a lot of young workers. They have these jobs that don't pay very well and don't really uh, do much to fulfill their, uh, their identity. So <clears throat> they have these temporary jobs to make ends meet while they go to school, while they go to college, or while they try to figure out what they really want to do with themselves. Okay, that's the way it is for most workers. Uh, there is a global economy nowadays, right? Uh, the economy is, is, is global. You can uh, end up working somewhere else. You know, your, um, your employer might decide that uh, they want to move the headquarters to another country or move uh, manufacturing to another country, something that happened a lot over the last several decades, by the way. A lot of people lost their jobs because of that. Um, some people decided to move with the company and go and live in China, right? Or some other country, some other country where it's cheaper to produce the goods, right? Uh, most people will not move to another country, okay? But we do live in a global economy and change is constant. <clears throat> and things are always happening. It's harder to sort of achieve that vocational identity. It's harder to have a career and keep it, okay? Uh, between ages of 18 and 25, the average is seven jobs. Young adults change jobs frequently. They're not really loyal. The, uh, you know, from 18 to 25, the average adult will have about seven jobs during that period of time. Uh, you know, during those seven years, they will have an average of seven jobs. If I think about myself, let's see, I had during that time, I was a teaching assistant. I was a research assistant. Um, I was a part-time instructor. I'm a full-time instructor now. Um, I also, um, <clears throat> what else did I, did I do? I was also a, uh, I'm sure I had other jobs. Oh yeah, I was also a third grade teacher uh, for about a semester. Um, I started off right at the beginning. I work even, I even worked construction as just an, a summer job just to make some money and even landscaping, right? You know, mowing lawns, trimming trees and bushes. That's kind of how I started. Uh, and that's seven jobs. I'm, I guess I'm average. I had seven jobs in that period of seven years, but they were temporary jobs while I was going to school. And eventually I got my degree and I, I got my, uh, <clears throat> my permanent job. But before I, I had my permanent job, I was, yeah, I also had some part-time work. Okay, uh, development of the work ethic continues to evolve, right? Your work ethic, right? Uh, you know, your willingness to work hard, right? How long to work, how you work, all that stuff, right? It's part of your identity, right? If you believe in that, you believe in having a strong work ethic. It continues to evolve. You might be kind of lazy or not, uh, not very committed early on. And then when you find what's good for you, what works for you, your work ethic can change. And hopefully you'll be devoted to your job and you'll like your job. Are you happy at work, right? Uh, John, John Holland's six part diagram um, says that income and benefits are not the only goals of employment. When it comes to people wanting a, you know, to achieve their vocational identity, to find a career, they don't just care about money and benefits. Those are important things, but they care about other things as well, okay? Workers have healthier hearts and minds if their job fits their personal preferences. So workers will be physically and mentally healthier if they are a good fit for their job. And here, Holland's six part diagram right here, it shows you that there are conventional jobs, right? Where people prefer things that are structured, things that have to do with business solution, you know, planning, finance, conventional jobs, right? Um, there are realistic jobs, things that are more practical, right? Where you build things, you repair things. There are investigative jobs that involve things that are more, to more do with, with science, you know, and uh, things like that, right? There are artistic jobs that involve things that have more to do with art, social jobs that have to do with helping people and working with others. And there's enterprising jobs have to do with, uh, <clears throat> you know, persuasion, uh, you know, th people who are drawn to things that have to do with management, leadership, uh, marketing, and basically things that have to do with, uh, um, with uh, starting a business. So there's, that, that's John Holland's diagram. There's other ways to think of vocational identity and the different things that are involved. This is just one way. 
but it's not just income and benefits that matter to people. That used to matter the most, but now people really care about their job uh, as part of their identity, that it says who they are and they do something that they believe in. All right, so that was vocational identity. Uh, now let's talk about self-esteem. Okay, how do you feel from 18 to 25? What's self-esteem like? Okay, personality in emerging adulthood. So there is rising self-esteem. Uh, most um, uh, adults during emerging adulthood actually feel pretty good about themselves. Few of them experience a decline in self-esteem. Most of them have rising self-esteem, as you can see with the charts, right? At 18, their self-esteem, right? Uh, their sense of well-being at uh, 19, 21, 23, 24, you can see how self-esteem rises. You can see how it rises uh, more slowly for women at first. It's harder for a woman, you know, uh, to feel better about themselves, especially when they're young and eventually when they get married, have kids and develop a full career, they feel better about themselves. But uh, you know, self-esteem keeps rising for both sexes. It's just a bit tougher for women. <clears throat> um, you know, continuity and there's continuity and there's improvement in attitudes. Their attitudes, you know, change. They feel better about themselves. They're more likely to believe in themselves and accept themselves. The ability to set and work towards their own goals, make their own friends, all those things strengthen self-esteem, right? Maybe you're not living at home anymore and you're independent, right? You can set your own goals. You can decide who your friends are going to be, who you're going to date, whether you're going to, you know, uh, date or get married or have sex or that stuff. You're an adult now, right? All those things help with self-esteem. When people, when you're under the control of other people, right, and you have to follow other people's rules, you're not as happy. Okay, so your self-esteem rises as you become more independent, as you get more freedom, right? We have freedom in this country. It's important. Close family and friends. Um, Okay, intimacy versus isolation is one of Erickson's uh, eight stages of uh, development. Members, remember, inf int intimacy versus isolation is the stage where you determine, you know, where you want to determine if, you know, like uh, answer the question, will I find someone or why will I be lonely and miserable, okay? Um, so most of you are going to find someone, okay? So this is Erickson's sixth psychological stage that emphasizes that humans are social creatures right? We want to be with others. We want to find someone. We want to love someone and have somebody to love us back, settle down, have a family, right? We also want friends, right? And just people to, uh, to be with, okay? So, social isolation is actually very harmful at every age and in every culture, at every stage of development, every culture, social isolation is harmful. We want to be with others. And when we're not with others, when we don't feel connected, we feel miserable. We feel depressed. We feel... Uh, just socially isolated, lonely. Intimacy progresses from attraction to close connection to ongoing commitment. So it usually starts out with you're attracted to someone and then you develop a connection and you start talking, you maybe become friends and then you basically decide to be together, okay? That's usually the pattern of how relationships develop, right? You notice each other, you're attracted, drawn to each other in some way. Uh, you start talking, you become friends and then you take things further and you become committed to each other in a relationship. Marriage and parenthood, um, as emerging adults are discovering, um, are only two of several paths to intimacy. Getting married, becoming a parent is one way to achieve intimacy, right? Settle, actually settling down and raising a family. That's what Erickson meant uh, you know, by intimacy. Um, but nowadays, that's only that. Those are only two parts, uh, two paths to intimacy. You can become a parent, and some people do that outside of marriage. A lot of people nowadays, uh, you can get married and have a family, right? But those are only two ways you can do it. There's other ways in which you can also achieve intimacy. You don't have to be married. You don't have to become a parent, and you can still be with others. You can still be in a relationship. And we'll talk about different relationships in a moment. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, emerging adults and, and their parents. Um, so what's it like, right, with your parents during this time? So many uh, young adults, many emerging adults have what we call linked lives. They're still linked to some extent with their parents, okay? Success, health, and well-being of each family member is connected to other members. You know, you still care about your parents, and they still care about you, and they still, you know, can help you out, and people are healthier, happier, financially better off uh, when they're still connected with their parents. You don't just abandon them and say, hey, see you later, right? Or whatever it is, or uh, 
you know, see you in the next life, right? You usually maintain some kind of link, some kind of connection with your parents and it's good, right? They help you out financially. They give you uh, advice on how to be successful. They can even help you if they've been to college, they help you be successful, right? Um, you can still have health insurance, you know? The part of the Affordable Care Act is you can still be in your uh, parents' insurance plan if you are up to, I think, like 25, okay? Now, I know certain groups want to get rid of that kind of stuff, but that's not good, okay? Um, but all this is linked to your well-being, staying connected with your family, but not too connected. We'll find out in a moment that you do need freedom. You need, do need independence, okay? Financial support, say more about that. So parents of all income levels in the United States help their adult children. Half of, them, half of all emerging adults actually get uh, financial support from their parents. You still need it for the most part. Uh, most people still need it, right? Because college is expensive or uh, just uh, being able to, uh, to have your own place, whether it's an apartment or a home, whatever, it's expensive. And often uh, emerging adults will need help from their parents, especially for college. College is extremely expensive, especially if you're talking about a four-year college. It can cost more than what you make in a year, even if you have a job, okay? Even for parents, but they help you out as best they can. You know, they might just give you a couple of hundred bucks, maybe to buy some books, buy some books for you, put it on the credit card, or, you know, they help you out one way or another. Uh, some provide a little bit of help because that's all they can give. And some provide a lot. There are parents who are so wealthy, they will pay for everything, right? They'll pay, you know, for your apartment, they'll pay, for your tuition, they'll give you money for an for everything. I mean, if you can afford it, right? But uh, it's hard for the middle class who are expected to pay a lot and don't get a lot of financial aid. Um, and then for the for the lower class, for people who are poor, if you're if you're good enough, right, to get into a good college and you're poor, um, chances are you'll get plenty of financial aid, and your parents won't have to pay a lot. But you will accumulate a lot of debt, though. That's the bad part. But we need still need financial support at this time. The jobs that you probably have don't pay well enough for you to support yourself. That's just the reality. So you keep getting some kind of help from your parents. Most people, about half of them actually, is what it says. Global perspective, parental support and linked lives are typical everywhere. This is the truth everywhere. People stay connected with their parents. Their parents help them out one way or another, often financially. In some countries, it is valued more than others. In some countries, yes, uh, staying connected with your parents is valued more than others. You know, probably more like in Latin American countries, Asian countries and places where it's more collectivist, where people are more group oriented. The US is more individualistic and encourages children to kind of grow up and, and go out on their own and make their own lives. And often parents can still help you, still care for you, but uh, you know, not everyone and it's, uh, it's not always possible. You know, my, uh, my wife's uh, stepdad actually, when he, uh, well, you know, he died a few years ago, but he grew up during a different time. You know, and he grew up, he became 18. Parents told him, okay, you're 18. Get the hell out of the house. Go make your own life, right? They just kicked them out. And that's what parents used to do, right? Get the hell out of here. Go make your own life, right? Uh, nowadays, we stay more connected, um, still rely on parents because it's harder now. It's, it's more expensive. It's harder to make it nowadays, right? You can't get by on just any job. So you still need support. Some parents even go as far as uh, buying a home for their children. Isn't that nice, right? If you can afford that, right? Some parents will do that. I watch, you know, sometimes these shows on TV and a young couple in their 20s, right, recently got married, looking to buy their own home. And what's their budget? Oh, half a million dollars. How the hell can you afford half a million dollar home when you're in your 20s? Guess how? Parents, their parents providing a huge down payment of maybe $100,000 or $200,000 so that they can afford it. If you have parents like that, you know, that's good. They can help you out a lot. Um, but a lot of people don't have those kind of parents and, you know, aren't, they're not going to get too much financial support. But yes, if you're part of the upper class or, or you're lucky enough to have parents who lived in a home that they've owned their whole lives and it's paid off and the home is now worth a million dollars and they bought it for like a hundred thousand. There's a lot of stories like that, right? Um, yeah, they can help you out. And sadly, you know, I will tell you guys, and this is the truth. Most of those parents are likely to be white. They're the ones who have benefited mostly from this increases in, uh, in, in property values and stuff like that. They live in the better neighborhoods and their properties have increased. Those who live in Latino neighborhoods, poor neighborhoods, black neighborhoods have hardly had much uh, any appreciation and they don't have much equity, okay? And that's the reality. It's a very different reality if you're poor or if you're uh, usually a minority. 
too much or too little help? How much is too much help? How much is too little? Not just financially, but also uh, other kind of help. Sometimes adults provide too much or too little financial support. Okay, too much or too little, non, even non-financial support. Okay, non-financial support, but don't, not always money. Um, foster care ends at about age 18. Okay, so what if you were raised in foster care? You know, you got a family that took care of you. Hopefully they did a good job, right? But it ends at age 18. Age 18, you're on your own. And former foster children still need that adult emotional support and encouragement and financial help. It's hard nowadays, right? You're just on your own at 18. Like they, you know, it's like they kick you out. That's it, right? We're not going to be getting any more money from the government for you. So, you know, go out and make it on your own. Some of them still help their foster children. Some, some parents still do that. Uh, biological children um, often have this support. They often receive more support than if they're, in, you know, than those who, you know, were in foster care. So it's harder for those in foster care, right? This period of time, it's harder for them to make it because once foster care ends, they're on their own. Other children, right? You know, once, you know, they grow up, they're 18, they often still receive a lot of support. Now we also have, we also have the, so that was too little support, right? And we also have the opposite, parents that provide too much support that are too involved in their children's lives. We call these helicopter parents, like a helicopter. They keep hovering over their children, always checking on them, ready to swoop in at any time and, and solve their problems and rescue them, right? So they hover over their emerging adult children, ready to swoop down if any problem arises, ready to pay for their crashed car, right? Ready to protect them, you know, if they, if, if they get involved in some problem. And I'm not saying that that's necessarily bad, but if you're too involved in your children's lives, you can actually very, be very controlling and actually not let your children become responsible for themselves. Differential treatment may cause sibling rivalry or resentment also, you know, if uh, parents kind of take care of one child more than the other, maybe because one is more capable and does well on his or her own and the other one needs a lot of help. So the parents kind of are always there rescuing that other, um, you, know, that, you know, that other uh, uh, person, so to speak. I don't want to call them child, they're not children anymore, right? But helicopter parents are usually too involved. You need to let your, your, your children kind of grow up let them, you know, it doesn't mean you can't help them, but you shouldn't solve all their problems. You shouldn't pay off all their credit card debt, pay for their mortgage, you know, pay for their apartment and their car and everything. And you're like, you know, you're not, you don't let them grow up. You need to let them learn. You need to let them save and pay down that credit card, learn to pay for their own things. And you, you can help them out, but don't totally rescue them. They need to learn to take care of themselves. It's part of growing up. And if you're a helicopter parent, you are overdoing the parenting. And you may also be too involved and you also want to control their, their lives as well, as far as who they date and you know who they marry and things like that. And that's just wrong. Okay, let's talk about friendship. Friends are very important during any age, and, but they're still important during this time. Friends defend against strength, I mean, against stress and provide joy, okay? Friends make you feel better, right? You hang out with them, you go, you party with them. Uh, drink with them, whatever it is, uh, study with them, right? If you're in college, you know, they can do a lot of things for you, make you feel less stressed out, make you feel like things are going to be okay, make you happy, make you feel good. New and old friends are crucial during an emerging adulthood, okay? If we didn't have them, it would be a lot worse, right? We, feel, we, would, we wouldn't feel as good. We wouldn't have as good uh, self-esteem. Most single young adults have larger and more supportive uh, friendship networks than newly married young adults uh, once did. So people nowadays just have larger um, friendship networks. They have more friends, more acquaintances, more people they can hang out with and party with and, and socialize with than was so in the past. We, are, uh, we have more ways to contact people now, more ways to meet people. You know, we can meet on social media, you know, you know, there's Facebook, of course, there's college. College is a great opportunity to meet people and get to know people. I know that right now it's different right? And that's kind of been disrupted. And a lot of people are lonely because of that, because they can't see their friends or they can't make friends. They just started college and all of a sudden everything gets disrupted and you can't go. You can't physically go and you have to do online learning instead. And it's different. But you, people now usually have more friends and larger social networks. And it's good if those people aren't just your friends, but they're also each other's friends. They make you feel better. They defend you. They protect your self-esteem. They validate you. Uh, it's very important in emerging adulthood. If you don't have that support, uh, those social networks, um, you feel awful. You feel depressed. You feel more stressed out. 
And that they not only make you feel better, they also can help you, uh, uh, you know, uh, with opportunities. Some of them know people who can get you a job or who can help you get into a, you know, uh, you know, um, a certain place, right? Um, certain school or even, uh, you know, to a certain work for a certain corporation. Who you know matters, but not just for those things, but mostly it, it's best to protect against stress and make you happy, not just those other things. Not everybody can provide those kind of benefits uh, as friends. Gender and friendships. When it comes to friendships, men and women are a little bit different. Men tend to share activities and interests and talk about external matters. So men talk about sports, they talk about cars, they're very stereotypical with their friends, right? When guys talk to other guys, it's like, you know, they, they talk about stuff like that. They talk about external stuff, material stuff. Oh, you know, about their car, you know, about, about sports and about money. And they, that's what they talk about. They don't tend to talk too much about their failures or emotional problems. They don't open up emotionally so much and talk about, you know, the problems they're having or the fact that they're having this difficulty or they're depressed or lonely or miserable, right? Uh, they demand, men demand less of their friends. So they actually have more of them. Men tend to have more friends and they're less demanding of them. And, you know, they don't open up as much. So they need more friends to make them feel better. Women on the other hand are a bit more open, more emotional, more communicative, communicative with their friendships. Women tend to share secrets more, talk about more private stuff, reveal their weaknesses and problems, right? They expect more sympathy. So, you know, women are more intimate and emotional with their friendships. They're more open, more honest, they share their feelings um, and they don't need as many friends. They'll, they're, they can have uh, a few very good friends, very close friends, you know, and that's kind of all they need. They can have a lot of friends too, but they have some very close ones usually. But men, men have less close friends and they have more of them because they talk about external stuff, not so much about the emotional stuff. Men basically, when, when it comes to their relationships, uh, they get, uh, you know, they get more, uh, you know, more respect, so to speak. They get, uh, you know, just more of that kind of stuff because they talk about materialistic things, right? Look at me, I got this, I got that, right? Or sports, yeah, or team one, whatever it is, and, and make each other feel good that way. And women are there for each other. Women get just more emotional support. Men get more respect from their relationships. Women get more help from their relationships. That's one way to put it. Um, we should have talked about this earlier because it was coming up earlier. But and so I'm following the pattern of uh, topics uh, as, as it appears in the book. But it makes I think it makes more sense to put this earlier because we were already talking about relationships and things like that. But um, let's talk about a theory of, uh, of love. There's a theory of love. Uh, Robert Sternberg uh, uh, in 1998 proposed a theory of love. Um, and he said what he basically said, I could tell you guys a lot more about this, but I had to really cut it down to make it fit here. Um, but Robert Thurnberg said, when it comes to love, there are three components of love. There's passion, which is the physical part, that intent, that physical, could also be mental, physical, cognitive, and emotional onslaught characterized by excitement, ecstasy, euphoria. The passion is, think of it more like the physical thing, right? You're drawn to each other. You're attracted to each other physically. Uh, you have uh, um, chemistry, right? If you want to call it that. Um, it's, it's, it's the physical part, right? But it's also mental and it's also emotional, okay? You're also drawn to them emotionally and, uh, and, and mentally. But it's, that's the passion, okay? But the easiest way to think about it, it's, it's more like the physical part, passion, okay? Intimacy is closeness, right? Knowing somebody well, sharing secrets, talking with them, that's the intimacy, okay? And then there's commitment. Commitment is the decision to be together, right? Commitment grows gradually through decisions that, you know, decisions to be together, right? You decide to be together, decide to care for each other, right? To keep each other's secrets, to share things, right? And forgive each other. Commitment is the decision to be together and share things, you know, love and, you know, possessions and, uh, and also, uh, you know, just to be there for each other. That's the commitment part. So those are the three dimensions of love. Passion, think of that like the physical part, right? You're physically attracted to one another. Intimacy is closeness and commitment, the decision to be together. According to Sternberg, these three things together make up what he called consummate love, complete love. Complete love requires all three. And I'll tell you a little bit more about this that if you're missing some of these components from your relationship, you don't have complete love. 
right? If you have only intimacy, only closeness, you're just friends, okay? Um, if you have, uh, let's say, only the physical part, no closeness, no commitment, uh, that's just like a booty call, right? That's just like a, uh, uh, you know, sex, uh, friends with benefits kind of thing, which we're going to talk about. So depending on which of these you have and which ones are missing, you can have different relationships. If you want to have complete love, you need all three. So the Western ideal, right, is to have consummate love. Consummate love requires passion, intimacy, and commitment. All three, the physical part, the closeness, and the decision to be together. The ideal is difficult to achieve, actually. It's hard to have all three. Some things grow with time and some things fade, right? You may have all three at some point, but maybe not at, not at others, okay? But yeah, the physical attraction, the closeness, and, uh, and, and the commitment, okay? You need all three. Passion fades with time. You know, after a while being with the same person, uh, the physical part may not be there anymore. You may not be that attracted to each other anymore. Intimacy can grow with time, right? When you can get closer and then stabilize and commitment may deepen. You may be committed to each other over time. I'll tell you about my relationship with my wife. My relationship is involved differently. At the beginning, we had all three, the passion, the intimacy and commitment. We got married. And then as soon as we had kids, things changed. My wife changed. She's not the same person anymore. Uh, the passion is still there. The intimacy, the closeness, uh, that has kind of not really there anymore. We're not that close anymore. The commitment is still there, but we're not that close. I don't consider my wife my friend anymore, right? Since we've had kids, the kids matter, and I don't matter that much. That's kind of what has happened, okay? It's, it's, that happens in some relationships. We fight a lot about the kids. We disagree a lot. We're not really close anymore. We're not like friends, so to speak, right? We don't get along that well. And kids, having kids has changed all that. So the closeness isn't really there. We're not really close to each other. We love our kids. We're close with our kids, committed to our family and our kids. There's still passion. Eh, but as far as, you know, closeness, I would say that has weakened. Okay? There's hardly any of that left, to tell you the truth, right? Um, it's, it's hard to uh, be together for a long time. It's hard, hard to raise a family, especially if you have a special needs kid like I do. That special needs kid makes your, makes your life so difficult and you argue more. And basically, oh, as you argue more and you don't get along, the intimacy can kind of die out and fade away. You're not that close anymore. You don't even like each other that much anymore is what that says. But the physical part is still there, right? And the commitment is still there. Still attracted to each other, right? Still together, but yeah, we're, we're not that close anymore. Friends with benefits implies an intimate but not passionate relationship, okay? Friends with benefits, it's, you know, like a, you know, um, your, uh, your friends, so to speak, right? Um, and uh, you, uh, friends with benefits means basically that you uh, satisfy each other sexually, but you're not really, you don't really have the passion, right? It's not like you're drawn to each other or you have that chemistry. It's just your friend. It's just uh, someone you're using for sex. You don't like them enough physically to want to be with them. They're your friend. You're using each other for sex. You're not committed to another. You're not, you haven't decided that you're going to be together exclusively, right? It's, that's friends with benefits. There's different relationships based on what is, what you have, what pattern of that you have, right? Um, and uh, yeah, uh, Sternberg's theory is a, is it, was it Sternberg? Sometimes I get a little confused. Yeah, um, yeah, Sternberg's theory does, uh, you know, does a very good job of describing love and you know, the types of love you can have depending on these uh, characteristics. Um, and friends with benefits are a lot more common nowadays. According to research, about half of you in this age group have friends with benefits. You have sex with your friends, even though you're not in a relationship with them, right? Think about that, how things have changed. When I was growing up, friends with, were friends. You didn't have sex with your friends. As a matter of fact, there was such a thing as the friend zone. You're in the friend zone means you're not getting any. Um, so things have definitely changed. So there's some information about love. Um, other things here, things that vary with culture, right? And cohort, right? Depending on what age group we're talking about or what generation. Hookups and hookup culture, 
right? Nowadays, we have these things called hookups. A sexual encounter with no intimacy, no commitment. You just get together for sex and that's it, a hookup, right? You meet at a club or somewhere at a bar and uh, you just uh, decide to hook up for that night. You're going to have sex and you're not going to take it further. You're not going to be friends. You're not going to be committed to each other. No relationship. That's a hookup. It's also very common nowadays, right? How we become liberated sexually, right? Anything goes, it seems nowadays. It's more common in younger college students, men and people who are lonely, to have these hookups, right? Often involves alcohol too and drugs, right? You kind of are more permissive, uh, less inhibited, right? When you're under the influence of these drugs, you're more likely to have these hookups. Monogamy and polygamy. Uh, monogamy is basically when you are decide that you're going to be with one person, right? Um, here in the U.S., we believe in monogamy, right? One man, one woman usually, right? That's the heterosexual type. But now we also have uh, one woman, one woman, or one man, one man. But monogamy means basically you have one partner and you try to stay with that partner for the rest of your life. Doesn't always work out. Like I said, there is a thing as serial monogamy. You're with one person and you're exclusive, and then that doesn't work out, and you're with another person, and you're exclusive with that one, and that doesn't work out, and you're another, and you can have serial monogamy. But there's also such thing as polygamy, which is more common in other cultures. Both are affected by culture, and the degree, uh, the, the extent to which premarital sex is acceptable, and ex extramarital sex is acceptable, um, all that uh, varies by culture. Uh, if you are uh, a, uh, you know, uh, and here's the thing, like I told you guys before, often these rules about extramarital sex, having sex outside of marriage and sex before marriage, uh, apply those rules, whenever there are these rules or very strong cultural influences, the influences almost apply more often to women than men, right? Even in, within relationships, it's more acceptable for men to sleep around um, than women. The culture is more forgiving of men doing that uh, than women. But there are polygamous cultures. Uh, and when it comes to a man having, um, it usually means that a, it's a man having multiple wives, right? Not women with multiple husbands. It's usually a man with multiple wives. There are some rare instances in which um, a woman can have more than one husband in some cultures, but it's very rare. And in those cultures, what usually happens is like two brothers will have the same wife because they're so poor and they have a small piece of land and they need to keep the land within the family so that they can survive because if they split up the land, right? You know, the men, the brothers marry different women and they have to split up the land, uh, then they won't be able to survive because it's not enough. So there are some cases where, where two brothers, two men will share one wife, but that's very rare. And it's those, that, it more in some indig indigenous uh, cultures, okay? But yes, polygamy is, uh, it, it is uh, very common around the world. Actually polygamy, uh, in some parts of the world are, is more common than monogamy. And it's always the men who are well-to-do and, and, uh, and have more income, more status, more resources, or are more desirable in some way, uh, who end up with more women or more wives. And the ones that don't have much may not even have a, a wife at all, okay? And polygamy does exist here in the US. It's against the law, but we do have Mormons who believe in it and who are likely to live in Utah and often they're not bothered and they let them have their polygamous lifestyles often, but it's actually technically against the law. And some people have been arrested for that. Whenever the government decides they're going to enforce the rules, they can arrest a bunch of them. But most of the time they leave them alone. But yes, polygamy does exist even here in the U.S. Uh, love and marriage uh, in relationships. Okay. Um, previously, the way it used to be in the past, um, a third of the, they, uh, you know, a third of the world's families in a third, about a third of the world's families. Um, love does not lead to, did not need to lead to marriage because uh, marriages were arranged in about a third. Uh, in the past, about a third of marriages were arranged. That means the, uh, the parents decided who the son, who the daughter was going to marry and mar marriages were arranged. That used to be a third of the world's families that were set up that, that way. Less common now, okay, but it still happens. It's just less common. Still happens. Okay, and by the way, when it comes to these arranged marriages, research shows that uh, they actually fail less often than non-arranged marriages. When your parents do pick who you're gonna marry, right? Who you're gonna be with and start a family with and have kids with, uh, they usually try to find you someone who's good for you, someone who's decent and has a decent job, 
and is a good person, comes from a good family. That's the way these arranged marriages usually work out. Often though, they will also uh, will have an underage bride, which is not good in, in, in some cultures. Okay, and that's not good. Because of course the daughter has no idea what she's getting into. Um, but most of the time these marriages actually stay together. And there might be cultural pressure for these marriages to stay together. It, it could be for other reasons. But the marriages that where we choose ourselves, uh, they're less likely to, uh, to be permanent. About a third of families, adolescents, uh, meet a, a select group, right? And the young man asks a woman's uh, father for her hand in marriage, parents supervised interactions. Uh, it, that used to be, that was very common in the past where people met, right? And they became interested in one another. And then, uh, you know, the, the boy would ask the, you know, the woman's father for her hand in marriage. And, uh, you know, and they dated and uh, parents had a lot of control over what happened. And eventually they got married and, you know, they were allowed to do whatever, you know, allowed to do what they wanted. Um, but in a third of these families, by the way, it's still, it, this still exists, right? It does still happen. And, um, and it happens at, uh, differently in, um, in different levels of society. I don't know if you guys have just seen the movie uh, Borat, uh, the subsequent movie film, and they showed how the upper class people, right, the rich people, uh, get their sons and daughters together in a certain place and they kind of dance and they decide to talk to each other and meet each other. And they're hoping they're gonna date each other and actually become interested in each other and then marry each other. So the rich people basically protect their sons and daughters and make sure that they meet certain kinds of people that they arrange meeting and gatherings and, and, and get togethers where they meet certain kinds of people. So they only, they only meet and date and marry people who they approve of that still exists. But nowadays, most interactions are not that, okay? Most nowadays, you can meet whoever you want. If you're interested in them, you can date them and your parents may disapprove, but they can't really stop you, okay? Um, final pattern, uh, love, love marriages occur only after young people are financially and emotionally independent. In the past, yes, people used to get married when they were basically ready, financially ready. They had a job. They were ready to basically start a family and take care of children, right? And they were emotionally ready and independent. That's the way it used to be. Like I said, a lot of this still exists, but it's not as common as it used to be. Nowadays, there's a lot of this. There's a lot of cohabitation. A lot of people living together before they get married. It varies from nation to nation, right? It's less common in some countries than others. I would say it's very common, more common in countries where, where, where you have more freedom, right? In the US, it's very common. A lot of people live together before they get married or even live together and don't, and then don't even get married, okay? It's, it involves living with an unrelated person, typically a romantic partner to whom one is not married. Right, you find someone, you fall in love, you're in a relationship with them and you decide you're gonna to live together before you get married. You're gonna have basically a lot of the same uh, arrangements as you do with marriage, living under one roof together, right? You are you know, most likely exclusive, right? You eat together, watch TV together, sleep together, live together, right? It's like you're married, but you're not. You're having sex, of course, you know, that's cohabitation. I did it with my wife, we lived together before we got married. It's just something that is very necessary nowadays because uh, financially it's tougher. And if you can combine incomes, uh, it's easier for you, guys to, for you guys to afford an apartment if, you, if you're both working and you're living together rather than living separately. So often people do it with, uh, for financial reasons, okay? But it doesn't always end up in marriage, okay? Prevalence and purpose, right? Uh, so most young adults in the United States, England and Northern Europe cohabit rather than marry before age 25. Most young adults will live in the US, England, Northern Europe, right? Will basically live together before they get married. It's acceptable nowadays. It wasn't acceptable in the past. And by the way, cohabitation is still illegal in some states, but they don't really enforce it, <laughs> okay? If they decide to enforce it, they could throw some people in jail. And sometimes they do just to basically punish certain people that they don't like. But it is against the law in some states, though it's usually not enforced. Because trust me, in every state, people are living together before they get married. Half of all cohabitating couples in the United States plan on marrying eventually. Half of those people who are together, living together, plan on getting married. Some of them don't plan on getting married because they've been together and they know how bad they are for each other and they don't plan to do that, although they're still living together. Cohabitation is now the norm in the United States. It is what is most common now. The rates vary from country to country, like I said. 
two thirds of US couple cohabit or live together uh, before marriage. There's similar rates in other countries, right? Like European countries. Um, community culture and demographic differences matter. It depends your, on your culture, uh, your demographics, you know, it's less acceptable and uh, other cultures, it's more acceptable among, you know, white people than it is among Latinos or Asian people, for instance, right? Um, also depends on, you know, on other factors as well, religion, right? Less acceptable among some very religious people or if you come from a very strict religious culture, right? Um, education increases the chance of marriage and marital uh, child rearing. If you have an education, you go on to college, right? Uh, you're more likely to get married when you cohabit than if you're just living together and you're not going to college and uh, well, then you're gonna struggle more financially. You're gonna have more problems and you're likely to dissolve that relationship. You can see how cohabitation in the US has been rising. The number on the left there is the number of, uh, of unmarried uh, partner households. Not the percentage, okay, but the number. There's uh, almost 8 million. As of 2015, there was almost 8 million couples living together in the U.S. Um, according to a, you know, a survey. Uh, I'm sure it's a lot higher now, especially since it's gotten a lot more expensive recently. And now you just, you almost have to live together just to make ends meet, right? Very few people can, can afford an apartment or a house living by themselves. Uh, what makes a relationship succeed? Okay, so let's talk about other things. Um, you know, this is a time, 1825, where a lot of people are in relationships. Some of them get married. Some of them are living together. What makes a successful relationship? Okay, so marriage, right? Getting married, right? Uh, marriage evolves over time, right? And things that improve your chances of staying together are maturity. If you're mature, that usually means you're a little bit older. If you get married young, you're more likely to divorce, okay? Good communication. If you talk to one another, you're open with one another, right? That's important. You know how to communicate. If you don't know how to communicate, by the way, you're going to have more arguments, more fights. If you're more financially secure, if you have good jobs, good financial, good income, you're more likely to stay together. If you have unstable income or you're poor, you have less financial security, uh, you're going to fight more over all sorts of things. You're going to be more frustrated, right? If you're, if you're married and you don't have a lot of money, and the husband all of a sudden goes out and buys himself, uh, you know, a nice set of rims for his car, for his car that costs thousands of dollars. There's going to be problems. You know, they're going to fight. Like, why the hell did you go out and buy those rims? Can't you know that we can barely afford to pay the bills? Why the hell do you have to be so selfish? And they're going to have arguments like that. But if you're middle class, upper class, and the husband decides that he's going to buy himself a $3,000 set of rims, it's no big deal. She may not agree with it, may not approve of it, but it's not going to cause that many problems. I bought myself an electric bike about a year ago. Cost a bunch of money. My wife didn't like it, but it's not a big deal. We can afford it. Do something like that or things like that. Be irresponsible with money when, you're, when you have less money and you're going to have a lot more problems, especially if you're relying on each other to make ends meet. Uh, end of addictions, illness, right? If, you have, if you're not addicted, you don't have mental illness, things like that, you're more likely to stay together, right? And usually 18 and 25 is a healthier time Okay, you're actually usually physically and mentally healthier, but some people do have addictions, psychological problems. We talked about that in the previous chapter. Similarities and differences also matter. Similarities tend to solidify commitment. Homogamy uh, means that uh, basically that's when people uh, marry each other who are similar. They're different, they're, I mean, they're similar. They're, for instance, the same religion, um, maybe same culture, same race, they believe similar things, maybe uh, politically, uh, they're similar, okay? That's homogamy. Hetero heterogamy is when there, you have marriage between people who tend to be dissimilar. Different religion, different race, right? Maybe even different like social economic uh, class, like say somebody middle class marrying somebody who's lower class or someone upper class marrying somebody who's middle class, right? I will tell you though that the upper class usually does not marry uh, those that are middle class or even lower class. They usually marry among themselves and the upper class and the rich people, the, especially the very rich people, like I said, they set up situations where their kids can meet so that rich people marry other rich kids, uh, rich people marry other rich people and date other rich people. They don't even give us a chance, right? To marry one of these rich people, right? You're not gonna meet them for the most part. You might meet them in college. That's your best chance, by the way. 
a lot of people there from wealthy families that you do have a chance of meeting. But even then, if you're not uh, in within their class, they'll probably disapprove of you. But heter heterogamy is when you marry somebody different, different social class, different religion, maybe different race, which by the way, race is not a real thing. It's, it's, it's artificial, it doesn't really exist. Um, you know, similar religion, culture, right? That's heterogam heterogamy. Hetero means different. Um, now, when there are problems within uh, relationships, within marriages, right? Uh, there's different patterns that you can have when it comes to these problems. You can have what's called a demand withdrawal interaction, which is very typical, by the way, in my marriage, right? A situation in which uh, one of the, in a romantic relationship where one person wants to address a certain issue and the other person refuses. So one person wants to complain and argue about something and the other person doesn't want to talk about it. That's the demand withdrawal interaction. One person is demanding, but we talk about this. We need to argue about this. We need to fight about this. And the other person says, I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to fight about this. I'm out of here, right? Very typical in my relationship. My wife likes to fight with me a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of sick of it. I don't want to deal with it anymore. <laughs> I, I walk out, right? It's gotten to that point. Um, I just, it's not worth it. Not worth it to argue, not worth it to fight in my, in my, uh, uh, you know, in my opinion. But women tend to be more demanding. They're the ones who tend to do more than nagging. I want to fight with you and argue with you. And men, uh, after a while, they cope with it by withdrawing. You know, you know what, I'm out of here. They leave the house, they go to the garage, they go to a bar, right? Uh, whatever it is, they have ways of withdrawing. And I have my ways of withdrawing. I go jogging, I go off into the hills, right? I, I go into my man cave in the garage, right? It's kind of like a man cave. This thing is already a finished garage with carpet. I have a couch in here, a recliner. You know, uh, I just need a TV. I could easily get a TV in here, but there's no restroom. But I could live in here if I wanted to, right? But you have to, have to find ways to cope. Women tend to be more demanding, more nagging. And, and men kind of just want to cope and you know, and, and deal with that and, you know, and, or not deal with it. And they have to get away. Otherwise they might, you know, it just, it's, it's draining. Okay. And you're more likely to fight if one person doesn't withdraw and the fights could even get physical if you don't leave each other alone after a while. Right. There's a point where you can get so heated that you're basically going to beat the crap out of each other. At that point, somebody needs to walk away. The inability to understand love gestures may be a contributing factor, right? The inability to understand when somebody's being nice or, or doing something nice for their person may be a contributing factor where, where for instance, uh, you know, uh, like maybe uh, the husband may make a certain gesture, you know, uh, let's say uh, it, it could be considered inappropriate depending on how you understand it, right? Gives her a tap in the butt or something like that. If she takes it the wrong way, She's gonna argue and fight. What, what the hell are you doing that for? I'm not a piece of meat. I'm not just here for your, you know, for your, uh, you know, for your pleasure, right? When he was just trying to say, hey, you know, um, you know, I want to do something right now, right? But it depends on how the other person takes it. That's just one example. And I've had that same difficulty with my wife, and I know now that I cannot even touch my wife unless, unless it's she's receptive to it, right? I cannot be all playful like we used to be when we were younger. Things have changed. We have kids now and certain things are not acceptable, especially with the whole Me Too movement. It's affected my relationship, right? Now I have to, well, not that it's not that it's bad, right? But my wife demands more respect, which is good for her, right? But, uh, you know, the playfulness, the slap on the butt or stuff like that is just not acceptable anymore. It is among some couples. It depends, right, on your relationship, but that can cause problems, right? Maybe you just see the problems in my relationship, right? My relationship isn't a very good one right now to begin with, right? Uh, it's difficult. Marriage is difficult. Um, it can get so difficult that it can lead to uh, to in what we call intimate partner violence, right? Hasn't really happened in my relationship, but uh, yeah, some people beat each other up. Emerging adults are more likely to be victims and perpetrators of domestic violence, right? They, they beat each other up. Usually it's the husband who beats the wife, but sometimes the wife beats the husband too. It happens both ways. Inexperience, hormones, Freedom from parental supervision and all kinds of things can trigger this kind of behavior. You're not getting along. Parents are not there to protect you anymore. Uh, maybe you're, um, you know, you have a lot of hormones. Uh, or, you know, basically you're still, let's say you're 18, you're still under the influence of a this bunch of hormones, right? Uh, aggression, all sorts of things, sexual desire, and you don't know how to basically respond to each other. You don't, and uh, you fight, you argue, and uh, it could get physical. Uh, NEAT is an abbreviation for something that's important that makes domestic violence more likely. NEAT stands for not in education 
employment or training. In other words, the people involved in this relationship are not going to college, they don't have jobs, or they're not undergoing any training to get a good job. So they're more likely to be poor, uneducated, uh, and are more likely to have problems. It's sad, but true. When you have less options, you're more poor, you're more frustrated, you have less options. Um, you're less educated about domestic violence in general or about relationships and what makes a relationship work, right? Then you're more likely to beat each other up. Culture and country of res residency matters. In the US, uh, domestic violence is not acceptable, right? If your partner calls the cops on you, they'll, throw, they'll, they'll take you to jail. Husband beats up the wife, she calls the cops, they'll take him to jail. Sometimes it's the wife that beats up the husband. And then the cops sh show up, you know, and, uh, you know, it depends on how the cops look at it. Sometimes the, the her wife will beat up the husband. She'll call the cops and get him arrested. I've seen that happen too. Often the man is seen as the instigator, right? And the, and the cops will usually see it more that way because the men are more dangerous. It's, but sometimes women do when there's proof, right? The man is the one who called the, you know, the police and he has bruises and she's not bruised or anything, they'll know that she's the one who did it and they may haul her ass to jail. That happens too. I've had family cousins where the wives beat up the husbands, right? That happens too. Um, and it varies by culture. In the Latino culture, domestic violence is common. It's also common and it's common in all cultures, I would say, but it's just more acceptable in some cultures than others. It's not acceptable here in the US at all. You can get in trouble for it, but it still happens a lot among all cultures. Uh, but it's more common in Latin America and in, uh, in certain countries, you're still allowed to beat your wives and the women are, have to obey their husbands. And if they don't, uh, he has the, uh, the right to, to basically beat her and it's okay. And that's the way it is in some countries. Women have few rights. Um, there are research challenges when it comes to studying domestic violence, right? Definition of abuse, what is abuse? What is domestic violence, right? How far does it have to go? Does it have to be physical? Can it be verbal too? Emotional? There's different kinds. Interpretation of the results, right? You know, um, there's different ways to interpret it. Like I said, based on definitions, uh, based on all sorts of factors. Stereotypes about abuse victims and perpetrators. The stereotype is that the, the victims tend to be women and that the perpetrators, the ones who, who do the domestic violence are men. But Often it's the other way around too. Men can often be victims and women can also be the perpetrators. It happens a lot more often than you think. It just doesn't get reported because when a man gets beat up by a woman and it's not that he can't beat her up. It's just that he doesn't wanna lay a hand on her because he knows he'll go, he'll go to jail, okay? So sometimes she takes advantage of that and she'll beat the crap out of him. And he's not gonna call the cops and admit that his wife is beating him. And it's embarrassing. And they, it often goes unreported and no one will say anything about it. Same thing with uh, women often underreported too, will not report it because they don't want to lose their husband, their relationship, and they will often not report it to their parents and the authorities. Causes of domestic violence. There's a lot of things. Being younger is a risk factor. You get married when you're younger, you're less mature. Uh, you're more likely to be a victim of domestic violence and more likely to be a perpetrator of domestic violence, right? Don't get married when you're young. You don't know what you're getting into. You can be marrying a very bad person or someone that you're, that's not good for you. Poverty, of course, when you're poor, you're poor, you're frustrated, you're more likely to beat each other up. Neighborhood chaos, culture of violence acceptance, right? It depends, right? If, uh, if you live in a bad neighborhood or you live you know, among uh, people on whom it's accepted or your culture accepts that, the Latino culture is more accepting of that, of men dominating women, right? Um, but here in the US, uh, I mean, men don't have as much, many, much right as they think they do, right? Because they can get into a lot of trouble for that. Men do have a lot more rights here than women still. But when it comes to domestic violence nowadays, uh, there are a lot of laws against you're not allowed to do it to, you know, to, um, to commit that under any circumstances. Personality matters as well, right? Do you have somebody who's nice and agreeable or do you have someone who's very disagreeable, aggressive? Someone who's basically an asshole, you know? There's people like that, a lot of people like that. You have to know who you're getting involved with. But the problem is when we marry someone who's young or get involved with somebody, you don't have to be married to be a victim of domestic violence, by the way. You get involved with somebody when you're young and you don't know who you're doing and you might have a very mean person, someone who uh, has criminal tendencies, 
someone who's really bad and you may not know it at the beginning. If you are in that situation like that, you need to leave that person. But it can be hard because they can threaten you, threaten to kill you, and basically, you know, keep you under their control and their power. Mental illness, of course, matters, right? A lot of people are psychologically ill, mentally ill. They have problems, right? They may have anxiety problems, aggression problems, uh, problems with schizophrenia, antisocial personality disorder, many different kinds of problems that can contribute to domestic violence. Substance abuse disorder, that's a big one. Drunks, right? Alcoholics, uh, drug addicts in general, you're more at risk for domestic violence if you have those addictions or if you're with someone who has those addictions. Childhood history of abuse. If they witnessed it when they were growing up and they've learned that that's the appropriate way to handle problems in a relationship is through violence, that's what they've learned. That's likely what they're, what, what they're likely to use because they've learned that, you know, the, that basically the woman needs to listen to the man. And if she doesn't, you need to put her in her place if they've learned things like that. Um, it could be even worse. There could be what we call, in, uh, actually, um, no, this is more of this intimate partner violence, okay? Uh, comes in, in different forms, two different forms of partner abuse. There's situational couple violence where fighting among couples um, occurs uh, because uh, it's, it has to do more with the situation, more to do with poverty or drugs uh, rather than personality problems. So it's, it has more to do with the situation. Me and my wife, for instance, the fighting doesn't get physical, but they can be yelling and cussing and things like that. Um, you know, um, but it has a lot to do with the situation. You know, we have a special needs kid and it's stressful and it's hard, right? Uh, and that can cause more difficulty. And if it gets physical, that would be the situational couple violence, right? And I, have, I don't hit my wife and she doesn't hit me, right? It doesn't get that bad, okay? Uh, if it does get that bad, you know, that might be a time to leave, okay? Um, intimate terrorism is even worse. That's when uh, you know you have a situation that is violent and demeaning. It's a violent and demeaning form of abuse in, in a romantic relationship where the victim is too scared to fight back, to seek help or withdraw, right? Where basically the uh, one person is terrorizing the other person, beating that other person and has basically psychologically broken that person where that person is too scared to stand up for themselves, too scared to fight back, too scared to seek help because the person is afraid that the other person is going to kill them if they call for help, right? Too scared to withdraw and leave the person because that person will hunt you down and kill you. It can be that bad. You know, you need to get away from those people if you're in a situation like that. There are places where, you know, people can go to get away from that type of abuse, where women can go. There are women's shelters to get away from a husband like that, where you can be safe, you know? I would imagine it's also possible that women could do that to their husbands, but it's almost always men who, who, who basically abuse and terrorize you know, their partners to that extent. It's mostly men, but it does happen. It does go the other way too. Okay, that is the last slide. I will now stop recording.